reading through the Bible in one year. August 16th, 1 Samuel 7 through 8, Romans chapter 6, Jeremiah 44, and Psalms 20 through 21. And the men of Kiriath Jerim came and took the ark of the Lord and brought it into the house of Abinadab on the hill and consecrated Eleazar his son to keep the ark of the Lord. From that day the ark of the Lord remained at Kiriath Jerim. And the time was long, for it was twenty years, and all the house of Israel lamented after the Lord. Then Samuel spoke to, the, uh, to all the house of Israel, saying, if you return to the Lord with all your heart, remove the foreign gods and the Ashtaroth from among you, and direct your hearts to the Lord and serve him alone, then he will deliver you from the hand of the Philistines. Note, the first thing that he starts speaking to them as a new prophet in the land is repent. So the sons of Israel removed the Baals and the Ashtaroth, and they served the Lord alone. Then Samuel said, Gather all Israel to Mizpah, and I will pray to the Lord for you. They gathered to Mizpah and drew water and poured it out before the Lord, and fasted on that day and said there, We have sinned against the Lord. And Samuel judged the sons of Israel at Mizpah. Quick note, Mizpah is also the place where um, Nebuchadnezzar and his army set up for um, the people of Israel as their new capital. This is functionally the capital that, that um, Samuel is setting up here. I don't remember if I read this line. I was almost positive I did. Ah, I'll read it again. It's not going to hurt anything. They gathered to Mizpah and drew water and poured it out before the Lord and fasted on that day and said there, we have sinned against the Lord. And Samuel judged the sons of Israel at Mizpah. Yes, I read it. Now, when the Philistines heard that the sons of Israel had gathered at Mizpah, the lords of the Philistines went up against Israel. And when the sons of Israel heard it, they were afraid of the Philistines. Then the sons of Israel said to Samuel, Do not cease to cry to the Lord our God for us, that he may save us from the hand of the Philistines. And Samuel took a suckling lamb and offered it for a whole burnt offering to the Lord. And Samuel cried to the Lord for Israel, and the Lord answered him. Now Samuel was offering up the burnt offering, and the Philistines drew near to battle against Israel. But the Lord thundered with great thunder on that day against the Philistines and confused them so that they were routed before Israel. The men of Israel went out of Mizpah and pursued the Philistines and struck them down as far as below beth Car. Then Samuel took a stone and set it between Mizpah and Shen and named it Ebenezer, saying, Thus far the Lord has helped us. Ebenezer meaning stone of help. So, the Philistines were subdued, and they did not come anymore within the, within the border of Israel. And the hand of the Lord was against the Philistines all the days of Samuel. The cities which the Philistines had taken from Israel were restored to Israel, from Ekron even to Gath. And Israel, rather, and Israel delivered their territory from the hand of the Philistines. So there is peace between Israel and the Amorites. Now Samuel judged Israel all the days of his life. He used to go annually on a circuit to Bethel and to Gilgal and to Mizpah, and he judged Israel in all these places. Then his return was to Ramah, for his house was there. And there he judged Israel, and he built, or rather, yeah, and he built there an altar to the Lord. And it came about when Samuel was old, because they knew he was going to die soon, that he appointed his sons judges over Israel. Now the name of his firstborn was the name of his firstborn was Joel, or Joel, and the name of the second was Abijah, and they were judging in Beersheba. His sons, however, did not walk in his ways, but turned aside after dishonest gain and took bribes and perverted justice, just like Eli's sons, Hophni and Phinehas, had done. Then all the elders of Israel gathered together and came to Samuel at Ramah, and they said to him, Behold, you have grown, grown old, and, and your sons do not walk in your ways. 
Now, appoint for us a king to judge us like all the nations. This is tantamount to rebellion. Because it's them saying, we don't want to have priests to reign over us. We don't want judges. We don't want what God has set up and has maintained this whole time. We don't want that anymore. Instead, we want to be just like those guys over there. They've got this awesome looking king and his crown is amazing. And he's got this super cool uh, group of people that follow him around and do whatever he wants. We want to be just like them. We want to, we want to be at all of the, uh, we want to be respected among all the other nations around us. It is our focus and our need to have the same type of thing that other people have. Because what God is giving us isn't enough. Again, this is the heart of covetousness, right? To look at what other people have and go, I deserve that. Or I need to have that thing, whatever it is. But the thing was displeasing in the sight of Samuel when they said, give us a king to judge over us. And Samuel prayed to the Lord. And the Lord said to Samuel, listen to the voice of the people in regard to all that they say to you. For they have not rejected you, but they have rejected me from being king over them. Like all the deeds which they uh, have done since the day that I brought them up from Egypt, even to this day, in that they have forsaken me and served other gods, so they are doing to you also. Now then, listen to their voice. However, you shall solemnly warn them and tell them of the uh, rather and tell them of the procedure of the king who will reign over them. So Samuel spoke all the words of the Lord to the people who had asked of him a king. And he said, "This will be the procedure of the king who will reign over you. He will take your sons and place them for himself in his chariots and among his horsemen." And they will run before his chariots. He will appoint, basically saying, your sons that are going to, uh, it's their job to take care of you when, a, when you get old. He's going to pluck them away from you. He's going to take the good ones and keep them for himself to rule and to do work in his kingdom. So they'll be taking care of the king's needs and not your own. He will appoint for himself commanders of thousands and of fifties. Some to do his plowing and, and to reap his harvest and to make his weapons of war and, and equipment for his chariots. He will also take your daughters for perfumers and cooks and bakers. He will take the best of your fields and your vineyards and your olive groves and give them to his servants. He will take a tenth of your seed and of your vineyards and give it to his officers and to his servants. He will also make, or rather, take your male servants and your female servants and the best young men, your best young men, and your donkeys and use them for his work and not yours. He will take a tenth of your flocks and you yourselves will become his servants. Then you will cry out in that day because of your king, whom you have chosen for yourselves. But the Lord will not answer you in that day. Nevertheless, the people refused to listen to the voice of Samuel. Sound familiar? And they said, no, but there shall be a king over us, that we may be like all the other nations, and that our king may judge us and go out before us and fight our battles. Now, after Samuel had heard all the words of the people, he repeated them in the Lord's hearing. And the Lord said to Samuel, listen to their voice and appoint them a king. So Samuel said to the man of Israel, Every man go to his city. Let's move on to Romans chapter 6. I think you know how it's going to go for them, but I'm just going to tell you now. It does not go well. All right. Let's see what we got here. So Paul continues. Remember, he's now expanding on what he was talking about beforehand, right? Um, first off, he's already proven that salvation is not through works, but through faith. He's just revealed in the last chapter that um, what we have from God, um, 
and rather this salvation itself that's been delivered to us is passed through Jesus the Christ and only through Jesus the Christ. It could only have come through Jesus the Christ. And that our own ability to try to save ourselves, if it were at all possible, would mean that it's entirely of works, which we know that that's not the case. Because he's already proven that it can't be. And he's revealed to us that there are two Adams, right? You had the real, the, the, the first Adam by name, right? From the Garden of Eden. That Adam had the ability to choose right and wrong. He had the ability to, to actually make these decisions and to serve God or not serve God. And he chose to serve himself. When we refer in the Bible to the lie, the lie is that they would be able to, that man would be able to judge what is good and what is evil the same way God has been doing. That's the lie that was told by the serpent to Eve when she convinced her husband to eat of it. And he is the one who condemned all man or all mankind into um, the curse because he could have told her no. He could have rebuked her, as was his role as her federal head. But he didn't. He, he took of the, the fruit just like she did. And when he did that, he condemned all of his children after him. That's what the term, when the day you eat of it, you shall surely die. That's what it means. It means both that you will, you will die in your relationship between you and God, and you will die in that you are forever cut off in your own ability from being able to serve God rightly. He was the last man who could make that decision until Jesus came. And then Jesus was the last man since then who could choose right from wrong, who could do that which served God and do that which served himself. And he always only ever chose to do that which glorified God. So now we continue. So what shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin so that grace may increase, that grace may abound, right? Right? Because if, if, if we're continuing to sin here and God's grace is increasing more and more and more to cover for our sin, well then, doesn't it glorify God when his grace increases like that? Especially for us as Christians, knowing what's happening, may it never be. How shall we who died to sin, we've died to that sin, how shall we still live in it? Or do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus have been baptized into his death? Therefore, we have been buried with him through baptism. Again, that symbolic dropping into the water, unless you're a sprinkler and then I guess they spit it at you or flick it at you or something, symbolizes your death, right? I, I don't know how <laughs> getting water splashing in your face symbolizes death like laying down in water would, but then when you're risen back up, that is your symbolized rebirth. So that as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too, in our symbolized raising back up out of that water, we too might walk in newness of life as a new creation. For if we have been uh, become unity, if we have become united with him in the likeness of his death, not in the same death, but in the likeness of it, certainly we shall also be in the likeness of his resurrection. Knowing this, that our old self, that old you, right? Think back before you were converted to, to the life you had then and the things that you focused on, the things that were important to you versus the things that are important to you now. If they're the same things, maybe you should go back and reconsider whether you're a Christian. Because they shouldn't be. They should be different. Your mind and your focus should be on how can I serve God more every single day? How can I, how can I meet the needs of my creator and king? How can I best serve him in every instance? Whereas before, if you were in a, a meeting at work and somebody slighted you and said something rude to you, you might have attacked them directly back. But now as a Christian, you don't attack them back. 
You think instead, well, the king of glory died in my place. And I, I, I acted exactly like that backbiting, angry person would. And I recognized that my flesh wants me to cry out against them the same way I used to. But that person inside me is now dead. And now I can choose to do that which glorifies God. That's how this works. And that's what we're seeing here. That's what it means to have your old self crucified with Jesus the Christ. In order that, or for the purpose that, our body of sin, that which we were before, might be done away with. So that we would no longer be slaves to sin. For he who has died is freed from sin. Sin only reigns over you as long as you are alive. Right? Thanks, Adam. Sweet. But it will continue to reign over you if you are not in Christ. It will continue to control your emotions and continue to control your, your desires, right? And it will continue to control all of these aspects of your life. But if you're in Christ, you're a new creation. And suddenly a war starts developing within you where the part of your body that wants to pursue all of these other things starts getting more and more and more riled up. Why? Because you have a new heart within you. You have new desires. And these new desires are at war with the, with the desires of your heart, which are to pursue and to please yourself. That's the struggle that's, that's erupting from within you. That's why this is so important. For he who has died is freed from sin. Now, if we have died with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him. Knowing that Christ has been raised from the dead and is never to die again. Death is no longer master over him. For the death that he died, he died to sin once for all. But the life that he lives, he lives to God. Even so, consider yourselves to be dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus. Therefore, do not let sin reign in your mortal body so that you obey its lust. That was, that's what I was talking about before. You need to war against that. And when you war against it, that produces perseverance. And you continue to build that perseverance, and that perseverance produces within you a, um, this is from the last chapter, but it continues to produce um, a, a character of obedience. And that character of obedience continues to produce inside of you these, these habits of continual obedience to God. And it gets easier and easier and easier the longer you do it. But you've got to start that war first. And if you slip, if you fail, don't feel bad. Everybody does it. Repent, get up, and keep going. The next day you get up, and when your heart desires, oh, well, I, I slipped yesterday, but, you know, it's okay if I slip one more time. It'll be fine. Stop it. Don't. If you have trouble with it, get help. Go to people at your work who are also Christians with you. Uh, go to your friends. Go to... Um, the people in your church go to your pastor. Your pastor isn't going to look down and you go, oh, oh, man, that person, that, they're getting right back into sin again. Oh, man, I guess they're not really a Christian. I have to tell the whole church and make fun of them. They're not going to think that. Remember, church, I know it's an old adage, and I know it's said a hundred times, but I'll say it a hundred more. The church is a hospital for sin-sick people. It's not for perfect people. You're going to always have people there who are struggling with sin. And again, if you're reaching a point where you're no longer struggling with sin, you need to reconsider your heart. You don't reach a place of sinless perfectionism. Sorry, John Wesley. It doesn't exist. God will continue revealing things to you in due time for you to work on. 
He'll reveal things in your own nature that should shock you to your core, that you've, you're, you're shocked and you realize it's been, you know, I've been a Christian for 10, 15, 20 years, and I never realized this about myself until now. And you'll repent of that, and you'll work on that while you work on the other things as well. You do not reach anything close to perfection, especially not in our walk of sanctification, until we pass through that veil of death and step into eternity with Christ. At that point, we don't have that struggle anymore, and it's taken from us. Now, we are absolutely, positively dead to sin. It no longer has, has, has that control over us anymore. But that does not mean that it's no longer a struggle for us. And it will continue to be a struggle for a very long time. That struggle may change. The things that you fought against yesterday or last year or the year before, they may not ever come up again. Or they could come back up tomorrow. And it could feel ten times worse because you haven't had to deal with it for a while. And again, you're going to get that fear that says, you know, oh, maybe I'm not a Christian because I'm struggling with this. But that fear, that's a good fear. Because that's a fear that drives you to repentance. That's a fear that drives you back to the king of glory and to say to him, please cleanse me. Create in me a clean heart, O God. Renew this right spirit within me. Psalm 51. All right. Where were we? Oh, yeah, Scripture. I've been here before. Even so, consider yourselves dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus. Therefore, do not let sin reign in your mortal body so that you obey its lusts. And do not go on presenting the members of your body, members, to sin as instruments of unrighteousness. But present yourselves to God as those alive from the dead and your members as instruments of righteousness to God. He's saying be mindful about the things that you do. Be mindful about the things that you think and the things that you say. And do that which, as I said at the very beginning, honors God, not that which honors yourself. And you'll be able to tell this after a while. You'll be able to feel that old self within you riling up when you want to go and pursue something. And you should immediately begin to recognize that and then change your mind or focus on something else or just go anywhere or because God will not allow you to, to reside within that for very long. If you continue to rebel against it, God will pluck you out and help you. The best and most effective prayer in all of these is Jesus help me. Jesus, take these thoughts away from me. Jesus, take my desire and put it on something else. Let me think of anything else other than this thing that's in my mind. And he will change your mind. And you'll learn day after day, month after month, year after year, that he is always faithful to do this for you. He's been doing it for me for 15 years. Every time I have one of those struggles, I give it to him and then it goes away. Not saying I walk in perfection. I sin all the time. I slip all the time into certain sins. And these are always going to be a struggle for me, and I understand that. And I look forward to the day that I pass through that veil of death. But until that happens, not saying I look forward to my death. Well, okay, I kind of do. <laughs> As a Christian, you kind of do. It's a thing. Um, but not in some macabre kind of way. It's It's... I look forward to no longer having that struggle, you know, to not having these battles anymore. <laughs> it would be nice. It's really going to be nice. But, you know, I'm on this rock for the next 50 or 30 or 10 or 7 minutes. For the next 700 years, my life is up to him and I'll live until he kills me. But the fact of the matter is that we continue to fight against the sin 
we continue to struggle and it produces within us this perseverance that eventually turns into hope so that we know that we can trust in our king to always deliver us. This is the life of the Christian. This is what he's saying here. And this is why it's important that we're mindful about all the things that we do with our physical body and with our mind and with our intentions. Matthew 5. Because God cares more about the intentionality of the things you do than the things themselves. For sin shall not be master over you. For you are not under law. Right? This had to be really confusing for the Jewish readers. What do you mean I'm not under law? I was born under the law. All of our people are under the law. All we've ever been taught is the law. But he says you are no longer under the law because the law can only bring what? Destruction and condemnation. You're no longer under that law of condemnation, but you are now living under grace. We went over this yesterday. This is something that is completely foreign to the minds of these Jewish believers. They don't, not even just the Jewish believers, but everybody. Nobody knows what grace is. It's a foreign concept to them that their God would look at them and understand the whole simuleusis et peccator, that they are both simultaneously at this exact moment in temporal space, a sinner, but in eternity they are justified. That's what we're seeing here. What then? Shall we sin because we are not under law but under grace? Again, may it never be. Do you not know that when you present yourselves to someone as slaves of obedience, or for obedience, you are slaves of the person whom you obey? Either of sin resulting in death or obedience resulting in righteousness. But thanks be to God that though you were, past tense, this is when you were converted, or before you were converted, slaves of sin. You became obedient to the heart of that form of teaching to which you were committed. And having been freed from sin, freed from that old heart, free, freed from that, that those old desires that used to rule over you, now you have become slaves of righteousness. I'm speaking in human terms because of the weakness of your flesh. This isn't, a, a, he's not being rude or being like, you know, saying anything negative against them. He's just explaining the fact that these people are young Christians. And it's, it's hard for young Christians to really, truly understand these things. So he's making it simple for them. And you'll find this. The more you read the Bible, the more you put yourself under um, its authority and understand what it has to say, the more you understand who God really is. And what, what his salvation means, and what his work in history past and in the future is going to entail. The more you understand these things, the more your mind will continue to expand. There's not like a finite box around all you can know, and the minute you run into that, um, things have to start shooting out of the side, and you forget things so you can learn more. God will take care of making sure you know all of these things. But when you're very first a baby Christian, been a Christian for a week, a month, a year, five years, ten years, when you've been a Christian for a short amount of time, you, you still don't know all of these things yet. Maybe you're in a church where they don't teach you these things. Maybe you're in a church that, that cares more about your felt needs or the felt needs of the community, the goats, right? The, the, the non-Christians in your midst, they care more about reaching them than they do about teaching you the true doctrine of Christ. If that's the case, you're going to starve. And you're not going to be able to grow any in any of these, sorry, grow in any of these things. And you will remain a baby Christian until the day you die. Still a Christian, but you'll never have expanded beyond any of these things. 
This is why it's important to focus on these things and learn from them and to continually grow in the knowledge of God, which is why we're here today. But that said, that's why he says I'm speaking in human terms because of the, the weakness of your flesh. For, for just as you presented your members as slaves to impurity and lawlessness, resulting in further lawlessness, so now present your members as slaves to righteousness, resulting in sanctification. Whereas before you pursued that which was evil because it was fun for you and you enjoyed that, now stop doing that and begin to serve God and you'll learn that the things that you used to think were boring and terrible and horrible and all of the things that you thought that Christians did, that was, that's stupid, I wouldn't do that. You'll learn why we do it. Because there's a deeper joy that comes from it. A joy you really can't contain. For when you were slaves of sin, you were free in regard to righteousness. You didn't care about the things of righteousness when you were the person who you were before, before God converted you, before he replaced that heart of stone with a heart of flesh, and before he led you to the point in your life where you could do nothing but to call out to God in salvation and repentance and begging him to take control of your life and turning over the full control of everything that you are to him so he can do with you whatever he wants. Before that happened, you didn't care about being righteous. You cared about serving yourself. If you don't believe that yet, keep following along, you'll get there. Therefore, what benefit were you then deriving from the things of which you are now ashamed? Again, as a Christian, you should look back on your old way of life and be ashamed of that recognizing the, 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 the pain that it was putting Christ through, the pain that it puts the Father through when you rebel against him. You should be ashamed of those things that you have done. And the outcome of those things is death. But now, having been freed from this life of sin and now enslaved to God, you derive your benefit resulting in sanctification, which again is a process. It's not a one and done thing. And the outcome, the eternal outcome, the final outcome, which is eternal life. For the wages of sin is death, is death. But the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Amen. Let's go to Jeremiah 44. All right. We've been coming up to this for a long time. I know it's only been a few days, like, reading about going to Egypt, but this has really started at the beginning of Jeremiah. I'm not going to recap all of that because it would take me a really long time. But just remember that every single time that the people of God, um, the Israelites, right, the, the chosen people of God, oh, have been told by Jeremiah, a prophet of God, who's speaking to them in the name of God, telling them, these things are going to happen. You need to do these things that I've already told you to do uh, umpteen, 20, 30, 500 times. You need to do all of them and live. And as all of them have been revealed to be true, they continue to fail to repent. They continue to fail to just do the thing. God's even saying, look, look, man, don't even bother repenting. Don't, don't do any of those things. Just physically stay put. Can you do that for me? Can you do that one thing? Stay here. Just stay in the land. <laughs> and they're like, nope, we out. So now they're running away to Egypt because they don't believe what Jeremiah said. And they don't believe what God said through Jeremiah. That what? That if they stay in the land, just literally stay put. Nebuchadnezzar's going to show up. He's going to look at what happened. He's going to go, you know what? I'm sorry that this happened to you. You can go back to your own plot of land that your family has had for generations. And you can live there and you can serve there. I just ask for a little tribute. No big deal. Just go and live in that land. 
And God told them this is what they would have happen to them. That's the best possible scenario. But they called him a liar. And they took him into Egypt, thinking that if God comes after us in Egypt, then certainly Jeremiah will die as well. So Jeremiah shows up. They're in Topanes. They, they, um, God tells um, Jeremiah to take some rocks, take four rocks, dig up the ground, put them in the dirt and cover it up and let the Jews see this and then let them know Nebuchadnezzar is going to park his chariot right here. He's going to set up his tent on this exact spot. And then he's going to utterly destroy you with the sword, famine, and pestilence. The same threefold destruction that's been chasing them from Israel. He said it's coming. And they continue to rebel. So the word that came to Jeremiah for all the Jews living in the land of Egypt, those who are living in Megdal, Topanes, Memphis, and the land of Pathros, saying, thus says the Lord of hosts. That means the, 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 the God of angel armies. You've heard the song. It literally just means that. Lord of hosts is the uh, kind of commander-in-chief um, term for God. The host we see here is the all of the host of all of the millions of angels that do his bidding and fight in his battles for him. That is a scary term, and they understood entirely what it means. The God of Israel. You yourselves have seen all the calamity that I have brought on Jerusalem and the cities of Judah, and behold, this day they are in ruins and no one lives in them. So you've, you've physically seen this happen. I told you it was going to happen. Through Jeremiah, not only Jeremiah, but through countless prophets that have lived in your land who you've been happy to kill because they wouldn't shut up telling you about the judgment God is bringing. And now that it's actually come, uh -huh, because of their wickedness uh, of these cities at which they committed so as to provoke me to anger by continuing to burn sacrifices and to serve other gods whom they had not known, neither they nor you nor your fathers, right? Yet I sent you all my servants, the prophets, again and again and again, saying, oh, do not do this abominable thing, which I hate. They can't say God never told them. They killed the people he sent. But they did not listen or incline their ears to turn from their wickedness so as to not burn sacrifices to other gods. Therefore, my wrath and my anger were poured out and burned in the, excuse me, in the cities of Judah and in the streets of Jerusalem. So they have become a ruin and a desolation as it is this day. Now then, thus says the Lord, God of hosts, the God of Israel, why are you doing great harm to yourselves so as to cut off from you man and woman, child and infant, from among Judah, leaving yourselves without remnant, provoking me to anger with the works of your hands, burning sacrifices to other gods in the land of Egypt. Congratulations, you came here, you're doing the same things you're doing before. Where you are entering to reside so that you might be cut off. That means killed and become a curse and a reproach among all the nations of the earth. Have you forgotten the wickedness of your fathers, the wickedness of the kings of Judah, the wickedness of your wives, and your own wickedness? And Sorry, of their wives, and your own wickedness, and the wickedness of your wives, which they committed in the land of Judah and in the streets of Jerusalem. But they have not become contrite. Even to this day, they haven't recognized their sin, nor have they bothered to repent of it. Nor have they feared, nor walked in my law or my statutes, which I have set before you and before your fathers. Therefore, thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, Behold, I am going to set my face against you for woe, even to cut off all Judah, and I will take away the remnant of Judah 
who have set their mind on entering the land of Egypt to reside there. And they will all meet their end of the land of Egypt, and they will all fall by the sword and meet their end by famine. Sword, famine, the two things that he was told, you're telling them that was going to come after them. The last one is pestilence. Pestilence comes when you live among the dead. Both small and great will die by the sword and famine, and they will become a curse, an object of horror, an imprecation, and a reproach. And I will punish those who live in the land of Egypt, as I have punished Jerusalem, with the sword, with famine, and pestilence. So there will be no refugees or survivors for the, for the remnant of Judah who have entered the land of Egypt to reside there and then to return to the land of Judah, to which they are longing to return and live, for none will return except a few refugees. Then all the men who are aware that their wives were burning sacrifices to other gods along with all the women who were standing by as a large assembly, including all the people who are living in Pathros, in the land of Egypt, spoke to Jeremiah, saying, As for the message that you have spoken to us in, in the name of the Lord... <laughs> Hold on. You knew it was coming. We're not going to listen to you. What? I know, I know, I know. This is, this is a new idea. But rather, we will certainly carry out every word that is proceeded out from our mouths by burning sacrifices to the dear God, Queen of Heaven, and pouring out drink offerings to her. I'm not going to say it. Just as we ourselves, our forefathers, our kings and our princes did in the cities of Judah, in the streets of Jerusalem. For then we had plenty of food and we were well off and saw no misfortune. Though looking back in the time before, when, when God was kind to them and he allowed them to continue in their sin, allowing them time to repent. He took care of their needs. He made sure they had food and, and they, had their, they had their reins when they needed it and they had all of this other stuff. Uh, without, granted, they were serving other gods, but God still took care of their physical needs. And now they're like, hold on, since you've been talking about this God of our fathers, or whatever that means, we've only been enduring tough things. So we're going to go back to serving the queen of heaven. Because back then, Things were pretty good. But since we stopped burning sacrifices to the queen of heaven and pouring out drink offerings to her, well, then we lacked everything and have met our end by the sword and by famine. <laughs> I love this book. And, said the women, when we were burning sacrifices to the queen of heaven and were pouring out our drink offerings to her, was it without our husbands? that we made for her sacrificial cakes in her image and poured out drink offerings to her? It said their Hail Marys. Then Jeremiah said to all the people, to the men and women, even to all the people who were giving him such an answer, saying, <laughs> I love this so much. It's like something just snaps in his head. It's amazing. I mean, you expect it at this point. As for the smoking sacrifices that you burned in the cities of Judah and in the streets of Jerusalem, you and your forefathers, your kings and your princes, and the people of the land, did not the Lord remember them? And did not all this come into his mind? He's saying, do you think God just forgot what you were doing? So the Lord was no longer able to endure it because of the evil of your deeds, because of the abominations which you have committed. Thus, your land has become a ruin an object of horror and a curse without inhabitant as it is this day. I'm going to butt in really quick here. If you think that you can continue to live in your sin and that things are going well for you, you're getting promotions at work, everything's going like you want, but you're still, you know, chasing that girl on the side your wife doesn't know about, right? Or or maybe you're, you're just still kind of embezzling a little bit of money here or there. You're stealing things just because it makes you feel alive. It's fun to do. You're gossiping. You're, you're saying horrible things about your people. 
that you work with because it makes you feel better about yourself to say those things and to pursue that, right? Whatever your sin happens to be, and you think that, oh, God doesn't care about that. Did not the Lord remember them? And did not all this come into his mind? There will come a time where the Lord is no longer able to endure it. Just like for them, just like for you. So think that through. Because you have burned sacrifices and have sinned against the Lord, and not obeyed the voice of the Lord, or walked in his law, his statutes, or his testimonies. Therefore, this calamity has befallen you, as it has this day. Then Jeremiah said to all the people, including all the women, Hear the word of the Lord, all Judah, who are in the land of Egypt. Thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, again king of angel armies, as follows, as for you and your wives, you have spoken with your mouths and fulfilled it with your hands, saying, we will certainly perform our vows that we have vowed to burn sacrifice to the queen of heaven and to pour out drink offerings to her. Go ahead. Confirm your vows. Certainly perform your vows. Nevertheless, hear the word of the Lord. He's doing this for himself now because he knows they don't care. Right? He's going to have a clean conscience as they are burned and destroyed by God when he brings in these armies to kill them. Hear the word of the Lord, all Judah, who are living in the land of Egypt. Behold, I have sworn by my great name, says the Lord. Never shall my name be invoked again by the mouth of any man of Judah in all the land of Egypt, saying, as the Lord God lives. Because again, that was a promise they used to make. By this point, they may have forgotten what it actually means, but it was a, it was a comment that they would typically make. Behold, I am watching over them for harm and not for good. And all the men of Judah who are in the land of Egypt will meet their end by the sword and by famine until they are completely gone. Those who escape the sword will return out of the land of Egypt to the land of Judah, few in number. These are the ones whom God has elected to be his remnant. They didn't, they didn't, successfully survive this because of their special offerings to the queen of heaven. No, God has chosen that they will not be destroyed when he sends in these armies to wipe the rest out. Then all the remnant of Judah who have gone to the land of Egypt to reside there will know whose word will stand, mine or theirs. And this will be the sign to you, declares the Lord. God is so kind, he's going to give them a sign to prove what he's saying. That I'm going to punish you in this place so that you may know that my words will surely stand against you for harm. Thus says the Lord, behold, I am going to give over Pharaoh Hophra, king of Egypt, to the hand of his enemies, to those who seek his life. Just as I gave over, I gave over. God is the one who gave over Zedekiah, king of Judah, to the hand of Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, who was his enemy and who was seeking his life. Just as I did with Judah, I'm going to do here as well. And you will know what I'm saying is true. Let's go on to Psalm 20 through 21. I'm telling you, I love this book. I love it, I love it, I love it. I love it simply because God is so um, absolutely sovereign from, from the beginning of the book to the very end. Man does whatever man wants to do. Uh, for the same reason that I hated reading through Judges, because God never shows up in the end and, and proves who he is to the people. It's just a constant... Um, 
It's a constant chronicle of the fall of man before God. Jeremiah is God constantly calling out against people who hate him and who hate his cause and hate everything that he is. And it's God calling out against them and telling them what's going to happen in front of them and then actually doing it. I don't rejoice over the fact that those people died. I don't rejoice over the fact that they were utterly destroyed and that everything that they wanted to do and even their children and everything they went through was just completely destroyed before them. I don't rejoice over that. It breaks my heart. But I'm glad to see my God being vindicated and to see my God glorified. Amen and amen. All right. Psalm 20. May the Lord answer you in the day of trouble. May the name of the God of Jacob set you securely on high. May he send you help from the sanctuary and support you from Zion. May he remember all your meal offerings and find your burnt offering acceptable. May he grant your heart's desire and fulfill all your counsel. We will sing for joy over your victory. And in the name of our God, we will set up our banners. May the Lord fulfill all your petitions. Now I know that the Lord saves his anointed. He will answer him from his holy heaven. And with the saving strength of his right hand, some boast in chariots and, and some boast in horses, but we, we will boast in the name, like in the character and nature of the Lord our God. They have bowed down and fallen, but we have risen. And stood upright. Save, O Lord. May the King, capital K, King, the ruling forever, glorious King of all creation, answer us in the day that we call. Psalm 21. O Lord, in your strength, the King will be glad. And in your salvation, how greatly he will rejoice. You have given him his heart's desire, and you have not withheld the request of his lips. For you meet him with the blessings of good things. You set a crown of fine gold on his head. He asked life of you, and you gave it to him. Length of days forever and ever. His glory is great through your salvation. Not through his own salvation, not through his ability to save himself. Splendor and majesty you, God, place upon him. For you make him most blessed forever. You make him joyful with gladness in your presence. For the king trusts in the Lord. And through the loving kindness of the Most High, he will not be shaken. Your hand will find out all your enemies. Your right hand will find out those who hate you. You will make them as a fiery oven in the time of your anger. The Lord will swallow them up in his wrath. And fire will devour them. Their offspring you will destroy from the earth, and their descendants from among the sons of men. Though they intended evil against you and devised a plot, they will not succeed. For you will make them turn their back. You will aim with your bowstrings at their faces. Be exalted, O Lord, in your strength. We will sing praise. Rather, we will sing and praise your power. That's it for today. We'll be back tomorrow. Behold the word of the Lord.